Howdy, everyone. My name is Raymond Robertson. I'm the director of the Moss Packer Institute at the Bush School of Government and Public Service. We're really excited about our conversation in public policy tonight. We want to thank you all for joining. Tonight's conversation in public policy is called Economic Challenges in a Post-COVID World. It's been such a pleasure to host so many of these conversations here at the Bush School. And it's been a pleasure to connect with faculty and students. And again, with this opportunity, we're really excited that you would join us here tonight, especially with so many of our Bush School and Moss Packer Institute friends all across the country. And we thank all of you for joining us through this magic of Zoom. We're especially delighted and excited to have Mr. Mark Giannone here from the Dallas Fed. And as a labor economist, I'm very eager, as all of you are, to hear his talk tonight. Dr. Lori Taylor from the Bush School will be introducing Dr. Giannone shortly, and she'll also be moderating a conversation with him. So please let me take a moment to introduce Dr. Lori Taylor for those of you who don't already know her. Dr. Lori Taylor is the head of the Public Service and Administration Department here at the Bush School and holds the Joe R. and Teresa Lozano Long Chair in Business and Government at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. She was director of the Moss Backer Institute for Trade Economics and Public Policy from 2014 to 2018, right before I tried to fill those huge shoes. Uh, prior to joining the Bush School, Taylor spent 14 years as an economist and policy advisor in the research department at the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. So she's very familiar with our speaker tonight. She has written extensively on public sector efficiency and has served as a consultant on school finance issues for a variety of legislative committees and state and federal agencies. She holds a PhD in economics from the University of Rochester and both a BA in economics and a BS in business administration from the University of Kansas. Lastly, I'd like to also note that today is Dr. Taylor's birthday and we'd like to wish her a very special yeah. happy birthday and let her know how much we appreciate you. So thank you for spending your birthday to dinner with us tonight. And now with that, Dr. Taylor, I'd like to hand things over to you. Thank you so much. Oh, wow, Raymond. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I will get even with you for your big mouth uh, at some <laughs> future date. And forgetting to mention that it was also my anniversary. So let's carry on. I'm here because this is so very important and exciting for me to get a chance to uh, hear insights from Dr. Giannone and to ask some of the burning questions that we all have about what's going on in the world economy. So uh, we're very, very honored today to have as our speaker, Dr. Mark P. Giannone. He's Senior Vice President and Director of Research at the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. Uh, he was previously a research economist and assistant vice president in the macroeconomic and monetary studies function at the New York Fed. He's a native of Switzerland and began his career as an economist with the Swiss National Bank in Zurich. He joined the New York Fed as an economist in 2000 before leaving to begin an academic career at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business in 2002. Uh, Dr. Giannone rejoined the Fed in 2011 while continuing as an adjunct professor of finance and economics at Columbia. He holds a BA and MA degrees in economics from the University of Geneva and a PhD degrees in economics from Princeton University. And we are just ever so honored to hear from him this evening. He has a few prepared remarks and then we're going to hold a conversation on public policy. But first, let me turn it over to Dr. Giannone to get us started. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taylor and, uh, and Dr. Robertson for, for having me this evening. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as you and happy birthday, actually. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I have prepared a few slides and I wanted to share this with you. So let me see if I can really do that. And I, let's see. So that should be on at this point, right? Um, and so uh, I look forward to the discussion afterwards and the questions as well uh, afterwards. So let me talk a little bit about the economic situation and the outlook, at least as, as far as uh, uh, I see it from, from here. And I, I should emphasize here that the views expressed here are really my own and do not necessarily reflect the official positions of the Federal Reserve System. Um, I'll, I'll make essentially three points. Um, I'll emphasize that the, uh, the current recovery is very different from what we've experienced in the, you know, in, in past recessions and certainly in the post Great Recession period. Uh, the labor market now gives uh, all sorts of mixed signals, and uh, 
look forward to talking about this more uh, in the Q&A as well, but I'll make the point that the labor market is characterized by robust demand for labor and fairly constrained supply of labor. And then finally, inflation. You can see uh, the word inflation showing up in the newspaper every day now multiple times. Inflation is obviously up sharply uh, in recent months, and uh, we expect it to remain pretty, pretty high but moderate next year. Although, you know, personally, I expect it to stay above uh, our the Fed's uh, two percent target uh, for some time. Um, so let me turn first to economic activity. So I think this chart really to me at least, uh, uh, highlights the fact that the uh, uh, recession we experienced during COVID is very different from what we've experienced in the past. Uh, if you look at to the right of this chart, um, the blue line shows real GDP for the US economy. It, it fell very dramatically, a really big spike down, followed by a very rapid recovery uh, in the early quarters after that. So an unprecedented drop in economic activity concentrated really in March and April of 2020, followed by a very short rebound. This is actually the shortest recession on, on record, uh, looking at the uh, NBER sort of accounting of, of recession period. Um, and uh, and output uh, only you know a year and a half after the, the shock hit the economy is now only about 1.6 percent below uh, CBO potential as of at least the, the third quarter of this year. Uh, but you know we, we don't yet have the numbers for the, the fourth quarters, of course. Uh, but chances are that we grew pretty rapidly and faster than potential. So that gap now is probably even smaller than that. And even then, uh, this really represents production, so the output, and uh, as I'll talk more about later, um, we are experiencing a lot of supply constraints uh, these days, and so uh, if you look at just domestic demand, so the sum of consumption, investment, um, you know, abstracting foreign inventories, and, and, um, and government expenditure, you can see that overall demand has, has essentially caught up with, uh, with its pre-pandemic trend. So to the extent that supply or production has not quite uh, uh, returned back to trend, uh, really reflects a supply constraint. If you look at this uh, big uh, uh, drop down and recover and very sharp recovery um, over the last few quarters and contrast that with what we experienced in 2008, 2009, you'll see uh, like a big, big, very big difference. So looking towards the left of my chart here, we see output gradually declining in 2008, 2009. Um, and then it took many years from 2009 to all the way up to 2018, 19 to really recover and get back to trend. So that's the sense in which uh, the pattern is very, very different. And so insights that we get from the, the post great recession periods don't necessarily apply to the current period, I would argue. All right. One. Um, thing I wanted to emphasize with this very sharp recovery is, is really what happened to nominal income or to overall uh, uh, income or average income in the economy. I'm, uh, in this chart, I'm showing you in the, with the red line what uh, aggregate wages and salaries did over the, the period since the, the start of the pandemic. And we indexed that at 100, let's say, in February of 2020. So what you see is that no, aggregate wages and salaries in the economy really fell sh very sharply in March and fell even more sharply in April of 2020, while we were all sort of in the lockdown, um, lots of jobs got lost in a very short period of time, people's incomes really fell. Um, and that, that red line shows that aggregate uh, wages and salaries actually have recovered pretty quickly. Uh, in fact, since April of last year until until now, and they are now actually running above uh, a four percent trend, which is roughly the the, the pre-pandemic trend. Now, the aggregate income uh, is, in fact, what we have here in the black line. And what's noteworthy here that this overall nominal income was above the usual trend line uh, for most of the pandemic period. So income actually increased during this recession and have been higher than trend during this recession, which is pretty remarkable and it's very unusual. And why is that? Well, 
the difference between the black line and the red line is uh, reflecting a lot of the stimulus that we got from the government. So the stimulus checks, the extra unemployment insurance transfers, and all sorts of other uh, financial help we got from the federal government. So that explains um, the, uh, the big difference between the two lines. And in particular, these big spikes that you see every now and then in April 2020, then in December, January 2021, uh, and then in March 2021, these are spikes that that really re reflects this big disbursement of checks, um, uh, stimulus checks that we got from the federal government. So overall income stayed high. Now, what did the impact of what was the impact of that on the on the economy? Well, one way to see that is look at what happened to consumption, and this is also a very unusual pattern, something that you we haven't seen in prior recessions. Uh, what we saw is a very sharp drop in real, so inflation adjusted personal consumption expenditures, so overall consumption uh, that fell again very, very sharply in March and April of 2020 while we were in lockdown and then we bounced back pretty quickly and in, is now again back on trend. So that's the black line I have here. Now, what's unusual is, well, for one, the speed of the recovery uh, but the other part that's unusual here is the composition between goods consumption and services consumption. Uh, typically, in a recession, services consumption remains pretty flat or pretty smooth, and goods consumption falls, um, uh, especially durable goods consumption, which uh, is more interest rate sensitive, is more uh, recession sensitive. People delay their purchases of, let's say, cars and other durable goods and services, uh, goods in particular. But in this recession, uh, what we saw is once the lockdown um, uh, got ended in May, June of last year, goods consumption was back above trend. So essentially people started buying all sorts of goods again um, and, and in fact spent a lot of the money they got from, um, you know, from their income and from the stimulus checks. Uh, so we've seen goods consumption actually uh, increase very sharply and be well above uh, the longer run trend. Now probably around you know over ten percent above uh, above the trend, whereas services consumption remains uh, relatively weak and uh, has not not yet um, returned back to its its trend. Why is services weak? Well, you know services includes a lot of the the things that uh, involve person-to-person -person contact like uh, leisure and hospitality. And uh, a lot of that has not returned back to normal yet. Um, it involves also air travel. That's not back to complete to normal. And in particular, the, uh, the business travel is not yet back to normal. Um, the, uh, in, in, as I said, leisure hospitality, but hotels and so on are, are still not quite back at the at the point where they were pre pre pandemic. So that shows up in weaknesses of overall consumption for services. Now going forward, we would expect that uh, this realignment between goods and services consumption to to uh, uh, normalize again. So we would expect uh, goods consumption going forward to be relatively grow you know, more, more slowly than the aggregate consumption and services consumption to grow a little faster than has been the case so far, so that we would return to, a, to a, an allocation that's closer to what we experienced before the pandemic. All right, so to, to you know, be a little more concrete here, I'm showing you recent indicators um, that we are tracking at a pretty high frequency uh, for different types of services uh, and show you that they, they are not back to normal yet. So if I were to go back, all show you on this chart numbers that go all the, back, all the way back to March and April of 2020, you would have seen that uh, TSA screening went very close to zero. Uh, uh, um, so very, they fell very, very sharply. Uh, now they are, you know, in, in the 90% of where of the levels of 2019, but not quite there at the um, at the level of uh, uh, pre-pandemic levels. So we we still have a little bit of a ways to go um, with that. Now we 
have been looking pretty closely here at the Dallas Fed at the relationship between the spread of the virus and uh, economic activity. And we've tracked mobility and engagement of individual by tracking essentially the mobility of uh, mobile devices uh, around, so for which we have quite a bit of data. So we've been tracking you know, what, what people do with, uh, with uh, their, their mobile device, where they move, uh, when they leave their home and where do they go and so on. Um, and, and by looking at that, we can have a good sense, aggregating this uh, data, we can have a pretty good sense of uh, uh, how much engagement people have with the, with the economy more broadly, with economic activity more broadly. And we've seen that with uh, each wave of the pandemic, uh, this mobility is, you know, tends to tends to weaken again. People move less, uh, hunker down, essentially do, you know, less uh, move around less to stores or to work. Um, but the impact on the economy has gotten weaker and weaker with each subsequent wave of the pandemic. So now the big question is whether the new um, uh, variant of the of COVID-19, this Omicron variant, whether that that seems to be um, spreading very quickly, uh, whether that will hold true, that statement I just made, whether it will hold true with the with the Omicron variant, or if Omicron will uh, lead uh, to a sharper slowdown in economic activity. So for now, I guess it's too early to tell. Uh, looking at recent uh, cases um, of COVID, hospitalization and death here on these charts, you can see that we are coming off the Delta variant. So the Delta variant is the last big bump here in cases on the left side of my, of my uh, slide. Um, but we still have about 80,000 or 80 to 90,000 cases a day. So still a relatively elevated number of daily cases um, at, this, at this point, right when the new variant is uh, appearing uh, in the US and is about to spread. So um, we could anticipate sort of an increase in cases again. Uh, and typically, as we see an increase in cases, that gets followed by an increase in hospitalization, and then unfortunately gets followed by increase in, in death per day. Um, so when that happens again economic activity tends to slow down a bit but as i mentioned before uh, with each subsequent variant of the of covid we've seen less of an impact on economic activity so the hope at, at least on on well the, certainly the hope is that on the health side we'll be able to manage that um, so that the impact will not be uh, severe on the on the health condition of individuals but uh, in terms of the economy the hope is that economic activity will not be affected too much by that. So let me turn now quickly to labor market. And, uh, and the big question here is, is the labor market slack or is it tight? And um, well, I guess there are a couple of ways to look at it. Um, for one, if we look at traditional indicators like payroll employment or the unemployment rate, clearly the, the pandemic had a huge effect on payroll employment. You can see this on the, on the left side of the chart that reinforces the point I made early on that this uh, recession was very different from prior recession. Payroll employment fell extremely sharply uh, in March and April of last year, but rebounded also extremely quickly. Now we are not quite at the level of uh, 2019 in terms of employment. In fact, we are more than two, two and a half percent below the levels of February 2019, uh, 2020. Um, but, uh, but we are, you know, employment at least in recent months has been, has been growing uh, fairly rapidly. We'll know more tomorrow about the November numbers. And the expectation is that that's going to continue to, to grow at a relatively rapid pace in, in coming months. On the uh, unemployment side, well, it's a sort of the reverse image of that. You could see unemployment rate jump off to a very high level of 14.8% in April of, of uh, 2020, has come down very quickly as well, is now running at 4.6%, uh, uh, maybe a little lower tomorrow, we'll learn that tomorrow. Um, but in any case, uh, maybe not quite yet at the so-called uh, estimates of natural rate of unemployment, whether you look at the uh, uh, Congressional Budget Office estimate or an estimates uh, that's considered as a normal longer run level of unemployment by the uh, Federal Open Market 
committees, this so-called summary of economic projection uh, estimate. Um, so unemployment rate shows a lot of normalization, but not maybe not quite yet at the neutral rate of unemployment, and certainly above the level we had uh, pre-pandemic. Um, however, the labor market is probably um, uh, a lot tighter than just suggesting by the employment numbers and the unemployment numbers I just showed you. Um, so for instance, there are lots of reasons to believe that labor supply is constraining the labor market. And so constraining the recovery and employment. So for instance, there, we estimate that there are about 2.9 million fewer workers now in the economy due to aging and retirement compared to uh, the levels we had in, in February, 2020. Uh, we estimate that there are about 0.9 million um, additional workers in the economy now that have caring responsibilities. Maybe these are uh, mothers who take care of children who are uh, not able to go to school full time. Um, and, and from all account, it seems like those who are involved in, in caring responsibilities, according to the BLS that are reporting in these numbers, are mostly, uh, mostly mothers. Um, the, uh, they, these may be individuals who have um, a fear of COVID-19 and returning to, uh, back to work. Uh, for a while, it might have been uh, workers or, or at least former workers who got unemployment benefits and, um, and decided to uh, prefer to leave off the, the unemployment benefit or at least had incentives to do so. And you know, given the, uh, the amount of unemployment benefit have now the ability to sustain, um, um, you know, uh, s staying on the sidelines of the labor market and look for better opportunities as opposed to uh, wait for better opportunities as opposed to take the, you know, the first available job. Um, the, uh, uh, we have also accumulated savings uh, in part due to the transfers I mentioned about uh, before, and also big asset appreciation. So big movement up of the stock market, for instance, uh, that has led some to, to uh, become a lot wealthier um, and therefore be able to sit on the sideline for, for a little longer. And finally, anecdotally at least, or from surveys, we hear about uh, individuals having been made, uh, making um, decision, different life, uh, work balance, um, uh, you know, decisions about what they want to do with their lives and, and potentially decide to, uh, to work less than has been the case before. All sorts of reason that you would think uh, affect the labor supply and therefore maybe mitigating the, the bounce back in employment. And we have a couple of blogs that I illustrate here that, that uh, argue uh, that. Um, next, uh, we have also firms reporting difficulties hiring. Uh, we've seen, uh, if you look at the so-called uh, uh, job um, uh, uh, labor turnover uh, survey, um, this JOLTS survey essentially, uh, shows that firms report big difficulties hiring. Uh, we have uh, job openings now at near record level. Uh, they were at record levels just a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, the number of job openings per unemployed individuals are at record level as well. You know, for each unemployed individual, we have 1.4 uh, jobs available. Uh, the quit rates is also at record level. So people decide to quit on their own, meaning that they are pretty confident that they might find another job if they wanted to. Um, the uh, we see another uh, evidence that points to very strong labor market is that we're seeing very very rapid wage growth, and and this is uh, uh, has been going on for some time this year, uh, but shows no sign of abating um, at this uh, so far. Um, and then all sorts of surveys again from firms or from individuals showing essentially the ease of finding jobs at this point. So all of that suggests that the demand for labor is, is pretty strong. All right, so then what are the implications of all this for, for inflation? So here's what inflation did over the past decade and a half. Um, the uh, blue line shows the 12-month uh, headline PCE inflation. So that's the favorite 
um, measure of inflation for the Fed. Uh, that's the one that they base the objective of 2% um, uh, for. And so that inflation rate can be pretty volatile, especially with uh, very volatile energy or food prices. So even when you strip out energy and food prices, you get that green dashed line here that's somewhat less volatile, but shows roughly similar movement. In any case, um, when if you look at towards the right of the chart here in 2020, when the pandemic hits, inflation fell, all right? So the, the pandemic initially, um, you know, had the impact of basically limiting demand, cut, you know, cutting down demand. Again, I remind you, we were in lockdown. We we're not able to buy much goods and services. And so uh, initially limited demand and price pressures fell down. Energy prices certainly fell, but also more broadly, uh, uh, the price of goods and services fell, or at least increased less rapidly than in, in, in prior times. Um, after about a year or so, um, the uh, in inflation has started bouncing back. Part of it is uh, arithmetic. It's a year-over-year -year base effect. But uh, more importantly, the, the really underlying force here initially was really sub disrupted supply chains, bottlenecks. And we saw more and more evidence of that. We all heard about these uh, semiconductor shortage and chip shortages, and you need chips in order to build cars. And so there were car shortages because the car manufacturers are not able to uh, have all the chips that they need in order to produce the cars. And as people wanted, as the economy reopened, and people wanted to use their cars to move around because they didn't want to have uh, go to public transportation, well, guess what? There was a big pressure up on, on prices of, of cars, uh, both new and old. Um, so that that's you know an example of supply disruptions and uh, and bottlenecks, uh, but we saw that more broadly in terms of energy goods. I mentioned semiconductor, construction materials, uh, metals, food commodities, and so on and so forth. Now underlying that though is a you know a, a, a number of shortages in a number of particular uh, goods and services. Uh, but also, broadly speaking, a strong demand um, uh, in the aggregate as the economy reopens quickly um, and stimulated in part by uh, fiscal and monetary stimulus. So um, what in, in a context where you have large demand and you have the supply that has difficulties meeting the demand, you would expect over time this price pressure to broaden. And uh, that's what we had been expecting for quite some time, but we're not really seeing it in the data. But finally, now we are beginning to see that. So in the last few months, we've seen really evidence of broader base, uh, less extreme price pressures. Um, you know, we see the the form, you know, the house price increase we've seen over the past year now starting to translate into increased rents, increased uh, increased uh, owners' equivalent rent. Um, we've seen the la tight labor market generally putting pressure on, on wages, as I mentioned before, but then also raising costs uh, of production and therefore uh, put pressure on final goods and services prices. So we see now uh, this broadening and this of the of the inflationary pressures. And again, the fact that the labor market is tight and tighter than it looks by just looking at, you know, uh, than it looks when you look at just employment, for instance, suggests that um, uh, we, we should be counting on some uh, price pressures at least for some time. So let me show you some data on that. I'm, the red line here shows you the so-called Dallas Fed tree mean PC inflation. Think of that as being the middle of the distribution of all the price changes. And so, you know, it excludes all the big price spikes that we saw earlier in the year, or all the big price drops that you might see every now and then. So it, it really looks at the center of the distribution of prices. And what you see is that that has been pretty flat, you know, not far from 2%, maybe slightly below 2% for a long time over the past decade. But in recent months, that has really accelerated. If you look even at the six month annualized trimming PC inflation, so really looking at the same data, but over the last six months only, and you analyze that, you see that really this acceleration pretty clearly here in the, in the blue line here. So to us, uh, 
you know, now the center of the distribution of price changes is running at about 3% or over 3% uh, annualized. We expect that inflation to slow down uh, going forward. Um, but, you know, we, we, so therefore, the, and you have a blog post uh, referred here that you can look at and tries to make the case for, for a scenario for inflation for 2022. We expect inflation in 2022 in you know around 2.6 or 2.7 percent uh, next uh, yeah over the coming year. All right. Finally, um, let me just talk briefly about monetary policy. Um, you know there were essentially two big uh, uh, levers, in fact, that the the Federal Open Market Committee uh, could activate. Um, in order to, to address the situation during the, uh, since the COVID crisis. One was to engage in large amounts of asset purchases. So in March, 2020, the FOMC started by uh, purchasing a lot of treasury and mortgage-backed securities. And the, the, the intent at the time, I mean, at initially was really to improve market functioning because the market financial markets were not functioning really well. And so they had to improve market functioning. And that explains a large, part of the initial increases in asset purchases. And you can see this with this big you know, spike uh, on the right of my chart here when the asset purchases really increased pretty dramatically. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but uh, uh, over there. Uh, at the same time, the, the Fed engaged in some emergency lending programs as well to support credit flow to businesses and so on and so forth. Um, and then, um, it, as it tried to provide more policy, monetary policy accommodation, really continued to uh, make purchases of treasuries and mortgage-backed security at a pace of a, about, I mean, about $120 billion uh, a month. And, and in December last year, the FOMC said it would continue to make those purchases at a pace of $120 billion a month until, uh, quote, uh, substantial further progress towards maximum employment and price stability goals would be achieved. Um, so the intent of that was really to push down on long-term interest rates, provide more stimulus to the economy. And now as we are seeing these stimulus and uh, uh, really to take effect on the economy and the economy being really, really strong and we've seen the substantial further progress toward maximum employment. And certainly in terms of price stability, inflation went from well below 2% to well above 2%. So um, in response to that, the, uh, the FOMC started so-called tapering the pace of asset purchases, by which we mean buy less than these 120 billion a month. And so over the coming months, what they have announced at the November meeting is that they would um, slow down the rate of purchases. And so with the, under the, the plans that they announced in, the, in November, you could expect sort of these purchases to end sometimes around you know mid 2022 um now we'll can go back to that in the q a uh if you want but uh, um the other tool and I'll, I'll conclude with this the other tool that policy used was really uh the federal funds rate so the policy rate and they immediately cut the federal funds rate target range um, in March 2020, and you can see here in my chart as well, the black line shows that the midpoint of that Fed funds rate target range, so the short-term interest rate, if you want, and they lowered this very, very rapidly to uh, close to zero, and have maintained that level of zero uh, since then. The idea of that is really pushing down all, all interest rates. Uh, but in order to help push down lower, longer term rates as well and other interest rates, the FOMC put forward also some forward guidance uh, on the path of Fed funds rates. And what it says is that it would commit to uh, keep the federal funds rate near zero until three conditions get satisfied. One is that the labor market reaches maximum employment. Two, that inflation has risen to 2%. And three, that inflation is on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. And we can talk about wh why these conditions were relevant. But in any case, um, these are the three conditions that they, they, uh, they announced in September of 2020. And again, as you can see, um, you know, since they have uh, assessed that these conditions, all three conditions are not yet met, they've, they've therefore kept 
these interest rates at zero since then. And that the idea of that is was of doing that was really to push down on longer term rate. As of September uh, 2021, the last time the Federal Open Market Committee made projection for the future path of, of the Fed funds rate, um, they produced this uh, so-called dot plot at the bottom right of my chart here. And you can see that this each dot here shows what each participant at the FOMC um, thought would be appropriate for the path of the Fed funds rate. So for 2021, you can see that they all thought would be appropriate to keep the Fed funds rate unchanged. For 2022, you can see that half of them see an increase in the Fed funds rate as appropriate, whereas the other half thinks it should be thought, at least in September, that it should be unchanged. And then you can see that the number of participants start disagreeing uh, or in future years with some really wanted many Fed funds rate increases while others see just modest Fed funds rate increases going forward. All right. So let me conclude now. Um, I, I make essentially three points. Uh, one is the recovery is very different from the post great recession. Um, two, that the en employment continues to improve, but um, is likely held back by supply factors. And therefore the labor market is probably a lot tighter than the level of employment or even the unemployment rate seems to suggest. Uh, the inflation rate is well above the Fed's 2% target. We expect it to moderate over the coming year, but uh, would expect it to remain um, uh, above uh, the 2% target um, as the inflation pressures tends to broaden to the economy. And obviously we always face risks. The latest risk is probably the impact of COVID-19 or at least the Omicron variant that seems to be spreading a lot faster and could be a downside risk to overall economic activity. Um, we could have, on the other hand, uh, more persistent inflation pressures that would, uh, uh, you know, uh, Put, put pressure on the FOMC to face a difficult trade-off here uh, with a weaker economic activity and high inflation. And then there are international risks and there are as well always uh, discussions and rumbling about what may happen to the US debt. All right, and so let me stop here uh, and I'm happy to take any questions, comments uh, and engage in the discussion. Great, thank you so much. Those are really insightful comments and uh, we're very grateful. Uh, it, it's now my task to uh, kind of hold a conversation to try and explore more deeply some of the issues that, that you brought forward and then to ask some of the questions that have been coming to me in the chat uh, for, uh, for your uh, consideration. So, but one of the first things uh, I want to ask about is that you, you made it pretty clear that this recession is unusual in a lot of ways. It's unusual in what triggered the recession. It's unusual in the monetary policy response. It's unusual in the, in the fiscal policy response. It's unusual in the sharpness of the recovery, particularly respect to um, with the labor market. Uh, how does it complicate the business of trying to identify monetary policy when you run into something you don't have a lot of experience with in the past? <laughs> no, it's certainly, that that's a great question. It certainly complicates it a lot. I mean, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, all if you ask all of my colleagues here, uh, how did it feel back in March and April of last year? We had a you know, pretty standard way of approaching the assessment of economic activity by looking at a set of indicator, traditional indicators, and trying to um, um, provide forecast based on models and things uh, of that sort. So we, we had a pretty well-oiled machine to produce all of that. Now, we immediately realized when COVID hit that, first of all, none of the models we had were able to provide any insight none of the data we had was going to provide any insight because all the data we had was outdated, was data that was, we knew that shock was right in front of us, that COVID was here, that it was going to affect e economic activity, but we had to really think creatively about how to even begin to assess the magnitude of the shock that was hitting the economy. What was an appropriate response? What could possibly happen? 
and trying to imagine uh, um, you know, how the economy could possibly evolve. So what we did was, I mean, we, we, we always have uh, a lot of contacts. And so we always make a lot of phone calls and, have a, um, and we have sort of nurtured that over the years. We have a lot of surveys um, that, um, where we ask participants in, in our industry, businesses, uh, for instance, uh, how you know how they see what's going on in the in the economy in their business in their line of business, and so we reached out to them very early on uh, and repeatedly and asked special questions and so on. So we use that network extensively. We um, we also uh, immediately started thinking about different data that we would be useful to assess economic conditions. So I alluded to that briefly before, but we started looking for data on tracking mobile devices, on you know, seeing the mobility of individuals and how do they engage with the economy. We started looking at a lot of new high frequency data uh, series. Um, and, and, and so started building a lot of indicators of economic activity, of price pressures and so on, in order to have a better gauge of the economy. So it completely turned um, the way we conduct our business uh, from one day to the next. And all that, you know, while we were suddenly, you know, away from our offices and sent home and trying to, you know, uh, from a technology standpoint, having access, you know, trying to connect remotely, um, access to uh, having access to, you know, uh, getting familiar with Teams or Zoom and this kind of things to be able to interact with others. So all the ways we were organized, uh, let, you know, had to had to change. So I would say not being able to rely on models, uh, traditional models, not being able to rely on traditional data uh, forced us to really step up and, and think creatively about how to address that. As we move out of the COVID era, are you going to go back to the old techniques or are you going to continue to rely on your new data sources and new analytic strategies? Yeah, so now um, I think, and, and for the now for the past, I would say year now, uh, we see that some of the more traditional dynamics uh, are uh, playing a role. The data is becoming more informative as well. Um, you know the traditional data is becoming informative. So we are we are we have been bringing back our models back to the table essentially. But but we need and I think this is where um, this is the job of an economist or a Fed economist is really to try to interpret uh, the data that comes out um, that that's available uh, and trying to interpret the output of a model. Uh, with appropriate judgment and saying, okay, here's what we know is in the model. We know what's not in the model. How does it, how is it, is it relevant for the current situation or is it not relevant for the current situation? That's where the judgment comes in. That's why, you know, a, a robot at this point cannot do it, the whole thing on its own, but we, but we need to exercise proper judgment. So yes, we brought back all our models. We are looking at them. We keep running them. We keep trying to improve them, to expand them. Um, but we uh, but we keep looking at these other data, and uh, we are you know uh, conducting frequent calls with uh, members of the community of uh, the businesses uh, that we interact with on a regular basis um, for our, via our surveys and and other direct calls that we have. So we keep doing it. So one one of the you you gave us a very uh, kind of complete picture of what's going on at the national level. But one of the things as a research director at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas is that you also pay need to pay attention to the 11th district, to Texas and little bits of Louisiana and New Mexico. And right. I have this sense that there were some substantial regional variation in the reaction to the recession and in the labor market tightness. Could you speak right. a little bit about how Texas did or did not differ in right. its experience of this recession? Yeah, no, very good. So Texas has been, I mean, already pre-pandemic, Texas was different, uh, distinct from the rest of the nation, from most of the rest of the nation by being really a, a state uh, and for us, the district that's, that's growing 
more rapidly than the rest of the nation. There's a lot of movement and migration to the state of Texas, uh, both by individuals and by firms uh, that, uh, that has helped uh, for many years prior to the pandemic already, uh, the state of Texas to grow, to grow faster and employment as well to grow faster. So on average, we had employment grow about 1% percentage point higher than the rest of the nation already be before that. Um, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, the overall, the, the hit to Texas was as large as it was, was somewhat smaller than for the rest of the nation. So we lost a little less employment than the, than the rest of the nation. I think the, the, um, you know, last year, I think the nation was employment fell by about 6.2% and Texas fell by 4.5%. So, so, you know, uh, a smaller drop than the rest of the nation, even if it felt really, really bad here. Um, the, the uh, now, you know, Texas recovered uh, towards the second half of last year and this year, maybe recovered slightly, you know, initially slightly slower than the rest of the nation. But the reason for that is it was coming from a coming up out of a, a smaller hole as well. So the rest of the nation was bouncing back from a from a uh, from a much deeper the deeper hole as well. So I think um, and overall I think in terms of composition uh, we we've seen here now in recent months uh, we've seen uh, uh, a slightly different pattern um, uh, then the nation, I mean, oh, sorry, already last year, we saw a slightly different pattern over time than the rest of the nation that was reflecting also differences in the waves of the virus. So we had, for instance, a big wave of the virus, uh, not so much in the first part in March, April, um, but that the, the, the wave really started in the summer of 2020. And we saw somewhat weaker economic activity in Texas than the rest of the nation. And then when that wave came down, Texas caught up again in the fall, while the wave of the virus started uh, showing up in the Northeast or in the colder states, if you want, uh, in the Midwest as well. Um, so it, the, the difference in activity really reflected um, different stages of the virus at different uh, parts of, of the nation. And then finally, um, I mean, in Texas, we have a lot of oil and gas, obviously. And so that sector got hit pretty hard uh, by the, in terms of employment, uh, by the very sharp drops in oil prices in 2020, um, benefited somewhat for the increase in, in oil prices in recent, in recent month of the last week. Um, and, uh, and we've seen, uh, we've seen, uh, sort of employment being, being particularly weak, uh, at least over, uh, last year, at least, uh, on, uh, in that, in that sector. So how has the pandemic impacted uh, our neighbor to the south, Mexico, and the interrelationship between the economic of uh, Mexico and the economy of right. Texas? So I think Mexico had a, I mean, in many ways mirrored what we had here in the U.S., namely, you know, pandemic hitting at about the same time. Uh, went to a very sharp contraction in economic activity. But Mexico, like many, uh, I would say more emerging economies, suffer from a more volatility and therefore a sharper downturn, uh, didn't have the ability to provide as much stimulus as we provided here in the US to, to, to rebound from, from that. And they suffered now from a, also from a strong inflation um, uh, response uh, on the upside than we do, uh, in part due to the fact that their currency tends to depreciate uh, against uh, against the dollar, uh, and so as a as um, in response to that high inflation, the central bank in in Mexico is is forced, like central banks of many uh, emerging economies, have been forced to uh, tighten monetary policy um, sooner than uh, what. Has what is taking place here in the in the U.S. So I think they they are you know suffered a bigger blow, a bigger shock, a bigger downturn. The profile over time is roughly not not very different, but it's just you know great uh, uh, more severe 
uh, there than it has been here in the in the U.S. And they haven't been able to recover as strongly as we as we have. So has has have those uh, recent political and economic events in Mexico had any feedback or or impact on Texas or regions of so, Texas? So okay, so on the on the um, on the border, for instance, um, the the border, you know. Uh, with the, the shutdowns last year, obviously the the border activity suffered tremendously. Economic activity fell uh, pretty pretty strongly uh, there as well. Now, the uh, surprisingly, tr trade and the border activity has been rebounding pretty strongly over this uh, this year. So we are now uh, essentially back to pre-pandemic levels in terms of activity in the in the border. Uh, part of this is also uh, boosted by by increased uh, border control um, and uh, and activity around the border there on the, on our end essentially. So um, shifting a little bit to, to speak about inflation again, um, yep. you were you uh, there was guidance forward guidance about the three factors that have to be in place to start having a. a willingness to raise interest rates. Right. And it, it seems like the, 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 the factor that's really not um, been met is the, is the labor market question of, of full employment. So has the, have the structural changes that you talked about that were creating a tightness in the labor market that were uh, maybe not being reflected in our existing indicators, have those changed uh, the structure of the labor market and how do you achieve full employment when the labor market seems to have these kinds of structural issues? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a very difficult question. <laughs> so, because I think the, I don't think we know yet um, how persistent these changes are. So one interpretation is that this could be just transitory. We have transitory tightness in the same way as we have transitory uh, uh, supply constraints. Uh, people are still afraid uh, going back to work. Um, you know, some there's some um, there's an irregular nature to schools at this point. You know, with uh, we don't have the certainty we or at least not in September we didn't have the certainty that the kids would be in school and stay in school whole years. And so I can imagine a lot of parents deciding maybe not to take a job just yet. Um, but they want to go back to, to work at some point, uh, but they just want to make sure that uh, their kids are going to be in school all day. Um, so these are, you know, these, these are factors that you, I would imagine, can over time get resolved. And uh, as COVID sort of goes back in the, in the background, and by the time we have uh, confidence that we have vaccines that are really effective, against the disease that we have pills that are effective against the implication of the disease and, and so on and so forth. Um, so on the other hand, uh, there are maybe more persistent factors and at least anecdotally, we hear a lot about that. Uh, those who make li different life choice, uh, life um, uh, work-life balance decisions now than was the case before. And so labor supply might be structurally, as you, as you mentioned, uh, um, uh, weaker or lower than, than where it was before. We knew uh, from a structural and trend standpoint that uh, the people, the population is aging and that we would have more individuals retiring over time. Um, and so a bigger fraction of the population, um, uh, you know, retiring over time. And therefore, as a result, labor force participation tending to shrink over time. So we've, we knew that, uh, except that now this has taken place more rapidly, you know, more uh, an increased amount of uh, individuals has now um, uh, decided to retire and retire earlier than was the case before. Um, so um, I think it's too early to say whether that's going to be permanent or it's just a, a temporary nature of it. So as as you look at all the labor market indicators, some show a lot of tightness, but this tightness might get relaxed. Um, in coming months, and others uh, show uh, still some slack, let's say labor force participation uh, or employment still being low, and that could get resolved 
pretty quickly um, uh, as well. My personal take of that is that, you know, at the end of the day, you look at the wages and you see wages really, really accelerating and, and growing rapidly. And so far, no indication that they are slowing down. And in fact, you hear, you keep hearing from businesses that they need to keep paying people more and they need to raise the wages more and so on. So I, uh, my read is, at least so far, the labor market is really tight. Um, it, it's uh, different than it was before. Um, and some structural changes, I don't know how long it's going to take for them to stabilize, but it, it sure looks like it's, it's quite tight. What should we focus on and pay attention to as we try and make a decision about whether this is transitory or permanent? Uh, I, I, I don't know that there is, I mean, traditionally the unemployment rate has been a very good measure of the summary measure of the labor market slack. It doesn't capture all the complexity of the labor market, but if you have to choose one, you know, the unemployment rate is a pretty good one. The overall, the headline unemployment rate. Now it doesn't, again, it doesn't capture the richness of, of the labor market. I think now there is evidence that it may not tell the right story um, because of this supply constraint and and, uh, and potential changes in the in the uh, in the labor market that we were just talking about. I would expect over time the the unemployment rate to start telling the right story again. So so um, when that's going to happen, I don't know. But I would imagine. I mean, I think it's plausible if I were to just guess, that we'll see vacancies progressively come back down uh, and we'll see the unemployment rate come back down and show more tightness in the labor market. But, uh, but the people are going to progressively go back to, to work and participate, engage again with, uh, with the labor market so that the vacancies will be allowed to come down. And so the, di the diverging signals that we have will come closer together. So that would be my, my guess. How long that's going to take, I have, you know, I can make guesses, but I don't know, yeah. Uh, one of the members of the audience would like to know what percentage of jobs in the United States are minimum wage jobs. And I'd like to know how much has that been changed by that upward wage pressure you're talking about? Okay, so that's a great question. And I would say, uh, and I, 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 I won't venture like a number uh, on that. I should know that, but I don't have the number off the top of my head. So I, I'll get back to you on, on that. I'll come back to you on that. Um, but what, one thing we know is it's very different from state to state, that there are some states where you Absolutely. have a very small fraction oh, of course. Uh, minimum yeah. wage jobs and others where you have a much higher proportion of minimum wage jobs. That's right, that's right. No, that's that, that's correct, and and that's part of of where the uh, the response to the uh, unemployment benefit supplements were playing a big uh, big role as well. Is that in some states, the uh, the supplement unemployment rate benefit we had were actually providing more more income to individuals than those who were you know uh, uh, were working. So that's where the the whole uh, debate was taking place and the incentives were taking place because of that. So that, that reflects the fact that, you know, you have a lot, you know. I, I, I could keep going. This has been quite the gift that you've given me of your insights and I do appreciate that. But our Bush School student ambassador, Arthur Johnson, would like to ask you a question. Arthur? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming again, Mr. Giannani. Uh, I just have a question on behalf of the student body of the Bush School. So uh, as students of public policy and public service, I was wondering what kind of job prospects we have with a place like the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas um, and what kind of skills we should be picking up as we're studying here at the Bush School. Hey, Arthur, thanks very much for, for your question. That's a great question. Um, Look, we, we are always looking for talent uh, at the Dallas Fed. Um, and uh, we are always looking for, for individuals who are interested in public service, uh, who are interested in, in at least in, in the research, research function that I'm in. Uh, we are really interested in individuals who 
are interested in doing, uh, you know, serious analytical work um, as well. So what would prepare uh, someone well for that? Well, we, we have several, we bring in people, at least in the research department, we bring people at different levels. So um, uh, first we have a number of intern positions that uh, then often, uh, not always, but often translate into research analyst positions. So people in, you know, students who are completing their uh, uh, junior year of college uh, might come in, in the for a summer with us and spend a few weeks with us working with some research economists, with other analysts uh, to help on the policy side, on some re academic research work and so on. Um, and then if they find this interesting and we feel like that's a good match for us as well, they get reinvited to come back as research analysts. And then typically our research analyst program is one where people would spend a couple of years with us at the Fed. And the idea is that, uh, so this is post-graduation. Uh, after you graduate, you would be spending a couple of years with us, developing skills, but also learning a lot about the policy process, about the research process, really figuring out what the life of an economist is. Um, and for those who really like that, who find that this is something that they would like to do, then we encourage them to really look into going to graduate school after that. And, and we try to help them and guide them to go to graduate school, do a PhD in, whether in economics or related field, and possibly come back after that and join us as, as research economists after that. Um, so that's, that's one path. You know? So there are different entry points at the internship level, at the RA point, and then as, as research economists after, afterwards. Uh, what kind of skills do we look for? Um, for people who come in as either interns or, or RAs, as we call research analysts, um, typically a degree or, you know, a major in economics and associated fields. Uh, we like to have people who have econ and math or econ and computer science or other, you know, technical skills um, that, but, uh, but I mean, some interest certainly in econ and some understanding of econ. These, these are the, the skills we are really looking for. And then there are a number of other positions around the bank. And here I just talked about research, but there are a number of other positions. We have um, you know, a lot of um, positions in so-called bank supervision in uh, our group of community and outreach, where they do a lot of work and also analytical work based on uh, what goes on in the, in the community. Um, and bank supervision, more, obviously more banking work and, and uh, trying to um, you know, and, and understand how bank functions and, and assess bank and supervise bank and, and so on. So we have a lot of positions um, in different areas at the Dallas Fed. And as I said, we are always looking for, for good talent. Well, I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Giannoni, and uh, of course, Dr. Taylor for having such an amazing discussion. I had very high expectations for tonight's event and you both far surpassed them. So it was very exciting. And I think uh, you're welcome back anytime and we hope that you will come back and, and visit us again. Uh, we'd also like to thank all the invited guests and I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Giannoni for a fabulous uh, presentation. And without anything else, we wish you a good evening and we look forward to seeing you again in 2022. Happy New Year, everyone, and happy holidays. Please be safe and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much again. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening.